Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. We will resume business now and uh, we turn to a member's business debate in the name of Rhoda Grant on condemnation of misogyny, racism, harassment and sexism. And I would invite members who wish to contribute in this debate to press their request to, sp to speak buttons and I call on Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to thank everyone who signed my motion. This is probably the most difficult speech I've made to the Parliament and it's not suitable for children to hear. Imagine you return to work after a relationship breakup with someone who is a work colleague. That relationship has been short but devastating. You have to take out a non-harassment order against your former partner and you suffer a miscarriage. On your return to work, you ask your line manager for time off to attend counselling and he tells you to go on your lunch breaks. He knows you have a non-harassment order but threatens to send you to work in another office beside your ex-partner. Your line manager tells you, I think I will go off with stress. It works for some in here. Well, it should work for me. He also says, effing foreigners shoot each and every bee. Coming to our country, taking our money, expecting everything handed to them. He also referred to women in extremely derogatory terms. I cannot repeat the language used here in the chamber, that it was racist, sexist, vicious and degrading. This is what happened to Deanne Fitzpatrick, originally from Canada and a Caithness Fisheries Officer, and I have been representing Deanne for a decade. The language her line manager used was commonplace in the office and often used in front of stakeholders. Deanne has been subject to institutional racism, sexism, harassment and abuse at the hands of Marine Scotland, a Scottish Government Directorate. Despite me raising this at senior levels in government, with the previous permanent secretary, with John Swinney, with Richard Lockhead, with Paul Wheelhouse, and the First Minister, the abuse continues. And I'm now taking my lead from Deanne, a brave, courageous woman, and I'm going to blow the whistle too. Deanne contacted me because she was concerned about another member of staff being bullied. I was aware of bullying at Marine Scotland and Scrabster, but I had nothing I could follow up. Deanne had enough of it and became a whistleblower. As a result, two male fisheries officers were suspended. One for pretending to punch a female member of staff in the back of the head. He was the woman's line manager. He was encouraged by the senior fisheries officer, Deanne's boss, who told him to make sure it was a good one. Deanne reported the incident. Both officers were disciplined. The senior fisheries officer was demoted and proposed for a move to another office and the, uh, the fisheries officer who acted out the assault was dismissed. Both successfully appealed. The Scottish Government know that the senior fisheries officer secretly recorded the disciplinary pa panel's deliberations, learned details that led then to their successful appeal. Then the senior fisheries officer returned to Scrabster office and he chooses a desk close to Deanne's and she is often forced to work alone with him. He knows she reported him. Work colleagues are also told it was Deanne that reported the incident. Over years, the oppressive behaviour is constant and undermining. For example, a fisheries officer has been off with the flu. The senior fisheries officer says, well, you could be like certain people, have a miscarriage and take six months off work. Initially, colleagues stuck up for Deanne and said, that was nasty. The senior fisheries officer then leaned over his desk and said to Deanne, no, that was not nasty, my dear, but I can be nasty. After she became a whistleblower, support from colleagues largely disappeared. She was continually pulled up on little things where her male colleagues were not. Deanne's overtime was cut. She told senior management and HR, but nothing changed. In fact, it gets worse because Deanne is referred to by HR as a serial complainer. Deanne asked for time off when her mother was critically ill. The senior fisheries officer said she wasn't entitled. Other officers were given compassionate leave without quibble. She checked with a more senior officer who said she was entitled to time off. The senior fisheries officer was very angry that she had gone over his head. Deanne and another officer hurt themselves lifting fish boxes. The other officer was told to record his injury in the computer system Deanne was asked to provide a doctor's letter. She was constantly being held to a different standard than others. Toil, holidays, time off for compassionate leave or medical reasons. Every occasion she was questioned while others were not. 
and I'm told by a colleague that this was deliberate and systematic conduct by others in the office and, the and in the line of command in Marine Scotland, designed to wear her down and force her out. Diane was the only female fisheries officer in the office in Scrabster, and she faced continued, continuous sexist and, uh, conversation and sexual innuendo. Diane hears an officer making a racist remark, and she tells him it is offensive. Her cousin is married to a black woman, and she's very fond of her. The response from the colleague was shocking, derogatory, and racist, so much so that I can't repeat it here. The senior fisheries officer then says, that is just effing up the population by them having children. The phrase he uses specifically to refer to her is, and, use, and is used by others in the office is so offensive, presiding officer, that you specifically asked me not to say it in the chamber, and I can't even allude to it without causing offence. We all saw the pictures in the media of Diane being physically restrained and taped to a chair and gagged. Officers photographed her to humiliate and degrade her because she spoke out about inappropriate behaviour in the workplace. The picture is now, will now take on a new meaning to you. The abuse changed from physical to verbal abuse, to try and, physical and verbal abuse to trying to get rid of Diane. And Diane faced disciplinary charges on a number of occasions, all of which have been spurious. Her trade union rep attended a meeting with Diane her manager and another officer four levels higher. This is the worst meeting he has ever attended in 33 years as a trade union rep. The more senior manager raised from his seat, pointed in Diane's face and screamed at her that she was a liar. It also transpires that the Scottish government intercepted Diane's emails, including sensitive exchanges with her and her trade union representative. Then a fully hatched plan between Scottish Government, HR and Diane's line manager was uncovered, which showed they intended to move her to the Outer Hebrides, failing that to find grounds against her, any grounds to dismiss her. Diane declares she cannot move because she is caring for her ailing mother. They moved to a dismissal plan, disciplining her for trumped up charges. This only collapses when they failed to provide the necessary evidence. Diane is then threatened with disciplinary action for going to her father's deathbed. In October 2017, Diane is told she must remain at home on full pay. She has not been suspended. She has given no reason as to why she is not allowed to return to work. She is now being pursued by Marine Scotland with further disciplinary action. The First Minister's investigation only looked at the incident with the photograph. Neither was it independence. My own evidence to that inquiry was fed directly back to Marine Scotland and twisted to you be used against Diane again. Diane has not been informed of the findings of that investigation. We now need a truly independent inquiry into Diane's treatment at the hands of this government and Marine Scotland. It cannot be put off any longer. Thank you, and can I thank the member for moderating the language. I know that she wished to use uh, very explicit terms, and I'm grateful uh, to her for not doing so, but I think she got her point across very forcefully indeed. Could I call uh, Rona Mackay to be followed by Annie Wells? Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I thank Rhoda Grant for bringing this important debate to the chamber today and for giving us the chance to debate this subject which should engage and concern every one of us in this parliament and beyond and as should the, sh the shocking case of Diane Fitzpatrick and I know um, it wasn't easy for Rhoda to have to outline all the details but um, it's, uh, it's important that they are, they are aired. Um, misogyny, racism, harassment and sexism has been highlighted very publicly recently starting with the Me Too movement involving Hollywood celebrities. However, as we know, this type of behaviour affects more than Hollywood celebrities. We know that it is prevalent in almost every workplace in Scotland and the rest of the UK. As many as 52% of women in the UK have experienced some form of sexual harassment in the workplace, and this Parliament was not exempt from that. As a member of Parliament's Sexual Harassment Working Group, along with Rhoda Grant, our survey found that a fifth of respondents had experienced harassing behaviour, 30% of women and 6% of men. 42% of respondents indicated they'd experienced bullying, harassment or victimisation in the workplace because there are black and minority ethnic women. And that's absolutely shocking. 
Thankfully, we now have an all-encompassing zero-tolerance policy to help and support victims, which comprises a confidential helpline and clear lines of reporting. Presiding officer, a few weeks ago, I attended an event at the I Write Book Festival where Helena Kennedy, QC, was speaking about her latest book, Eve Was Shamed, about women's journey through the justice system and discrimination against women generally. As co-convener of the Cross-Party Group on Women's Justice and the Cross-Party Group of uh, Men's Violence Against Women and Children, this was of great interest to me. Helena Kennedy spoke eloquently about the challenges faced by women, but one thing she emphasised really struck a chord with me, and that was that to combat this type of behaviour, we need men to play their part. It should not be left to women, as it has been for decades, to fight against misogyny and discrimination. Men must call out men displaying this type of behaviour. They must stand up and tell them that disrespecting women, even if they think it's banter, is simply not acceptable. In fact, it demeans the majority of men who do not behave this way. In exactly the same way that racism displays the absolute worst of human nature, it must never be tolerated and it's incumbent on all of us to stand against it. A helpful briefing from Engender reports that there have been dramatic rises in online misogynistic harassment, with survey data from Amnesty International finding that 21% of women reported having experienced online abuse or harassment at least once. The latest figures from the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey reports that nearly 27% of women aged 60 to 16 to 24 had experienced stalking and harassment over the last year. Stalking figures have more than doubled over the last five years, and I hope my proposed Members' Bill to introduce stalking protection orders, if passed, will give comfort to victims. So in conclusion, presiding officer, sexism, racism and misogyny feed inequality and demeans us all. We all have a part to play in creating an inclusive, equal society for our children and grandchildren to grow up in. And can I just finish by saying again that the case that Rhoda outlined was extremely, extremely shocking and no one should have to ever go through that. Thank you. Thank you. I call Annie Wells to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too also would like to thank, thank Rhoda Grant for bringing this subject to debate and for her very powerful contribution. Um, and I hope that this goes some way to ensuring that Diane gets the independent inquiry that she absolutely desperately deserves. Um, I have spoken in a few debates in recent months focused on violence, harassment and sexism against women. And I am pleased to see an increased focus, as we've seen by the popularity of the Time's Up and Me Too campaigns. Momentum is and must continue to build. At the same time, we must bring a renewed focus to addressing the additional barriers BME women face in the workplace. And this debate is a perfect opportunity to do so. Too many women in this country remain subject to sexual harassment and assault in their everyday employment. Never have we been more aware of this since the Harvey Weinstein scandal in 2017 and the, the unfolding events. Shockingly, a poll showed that half of British women and a fifth of men had been sexually harassed at work or a place of study. And of these people, 63% and 79% of the victims, respectively, kept it to themselves. We've seen steps being taken to address this. Workshops based on creating cultural respect have been run here in the Scottish Parliament, for instance. And earlier in the year, I welcomed the start of a new employer accreditation programme pilot in councils across Scotland. It was developed by Close the Gap and it's taken place over the course of 2019. The programme requires councils to take the necessary steps to address the causes of their gender pay gaps and to better support employees who have experienced gender-based violence. More, of course, does need to be done, and data is always going to be key, and I note that the call made by both Engender and Close the Gap for public sector employers to improve compliance with gender and employment aspects of the public sector equality duty. And more broadly speaking, I have stated before, if we are to understand and change women's experiences of the workplace, we have to set, see the whole picture. Women are still underrepresented, underrepresented in senior management positions and remain blighted by the gender pay gap. Only by implementing bold childcare measures, improving flexible working and inspiring young women through education reform will we start to see real societal change. I also want to see a renewed focus on tackling the additional barriers BME women face in the workplace. 
A survey by Close the Gap on the experience of BME women revealed some startling figures. 72% of respondents said they had experienced racism, discrimination, racial prejudice or bias in the workplace. 52% did not feel comfortable or confident in reporting it. And of those that did, only 23% were satisfied with their compl that their complaint was handled, the way their complaint was handled. And prior to this debate, I contacted the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights to ask what it understood to be the main issues. And Claire noted the distinct lack of data around BME women's experiences in the workplace, owed in part to the severe lack of BME women in Scotland's workplaces, including the public sector. Very rarely, if at all, has a public body published intersectional data on gender and race in their public sector equality duty reports. In relation to the Scottish Government's Equality Evidence Finder, it is not clear what steps are being taken to address key gaps in, da in data, particularly in relation to prejudice-based bullying, hate crime and harassment, especially in the workplace. This would be a fundamental first step in truly understanding the experience of BME women across the labour market. Only then can we make real strides in improving some of the shocking statistics we heard earlier. Presiding officer, I would like to finish today by thanking the organisations that have either that have either met with me in the recent weeks or sent briefings prior to this debate. I have really noticed in the past 18 months that we are talking more and more about the experiences of women, both inside and outside the workplace. These discussions must continue if we are to press ahead for change. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Monica Lennon to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to commend my colleague Rhoda Grant for securing this debate and to say to her, um, thank you. Thank you for believing women. Thank you for believing in Deanne Fitzpatrick. Like Rhoda, um, or listening to Rhoda, I, I feel like my heart is racing because I, I feel angry hearing that. Um, and Deanne's experience is not isolated. It's not unusual. Um, so I hope we all feel angry and society doesn't like angry women. Society doesn't reward angry women. But we have to stand up. And I look to young people in the gallery. And we have to depend on you to say that this can't continue. We need change um, to prevent the next generation from going through this kind of um, rubbish. And we need to say not in our name. And I'm glad that because of Rhoda's debate, all members of all parties can stand here today to unite in this chamber in condemnation of misogyny, racism, harassment and sexism against women. Because according to Close the Gap, three million women each year in the UK experience violence against them and the workplace is no different. Imagine going to your place of work knowing you're going to be subjected to sexism, harassment, bullying, to be ridiculed and degraded, all because you're a woman. And it's not unusual, 70% of women in Scotland have witnessed or experienced sexual harassment. So that means there's a lot of bystanders. So I agree with Rhoda Grant, it's beyond time to blow the whistle on this oppressive behaviour and often criminal behaviour. Deanne Fitzpatrick showed courage and bravery in stepping forward and speaking about her experience, but we've heard about a decade of abuse. My own brave constituent, lawyer Kerry Evans, has publicly spoken about her own experience of bullying in the workplace. Um, she's a, or she was a public defence um, solicitor, but she's had to resign from, from her job. Um, I've raised Kerry's story with the First Minister. I've raised it in the chamber. It's been aired through the, the Sunday Mail. Um, Kerry was one of three women working in a branch of the Public Defence Solicitor's Office who brought about a complaint about the same individual a male manager. Um, Kerry kept a diary of her experiences and did what ministers have advised me to report these things. But the Information Commissioner's Office have since warned the PDSO for breaching Kerry's data protection rights because that diary was handed over to her alleged perpetrator, perpetrator. So again, it's a further example that as MSPs, we are seeing these cases and we're seeing them far too often. So Kerry has, her fight is not over, but Kerry Evans has resigned from her job because she couldn't take it any longer. And Kerry is bright, intelligent, passionate, cares deeply, the kind of person who has got oozes emotional intelligence. And the fact that she's no longer in her public service post 
means that Scotland is worse off for that. So we need culture change. Um, women remain underrepresented in uh, many sectors of the economy, but look at in politics. 35% um, of our members here are women. You go into local government and it, it drops down to 29% and there's variation within local authorities. So even within political parties, we're not valuing um, diversity, we're not respecting women, we're still arguing about um, the use of all women's shortlists and um, other, other tools we can use to increase diversity. Um, Lynn Henderson, who's a trade union leader, president of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, has a great campaign which is Step Aside Brother. And she's saying true power is present, not when you grasp it and hold on to it, but when you give it away to someone else. So we need to respect everyone. Of course, we have to respect men, women, um, but we have to recognise that there is a power imbalance. There's a power imbalance, and when that is abused, this kind of behaviour can perpetuate. So I would again like to, to thank um, Rhoda Grant, but presiding officer, there's a desperate need for employers, for public agencies, for other bodies, social media platforms, but all of us, all of us in political parties, those who are in government, to do something. We can't keep talking about this. We have to act, and we have to act now. Thank you. Can I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Anas Awa? I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to take part in this debate, presiding officer, and can I thank Rhoda Grant for bringing this motion for, for discussion to the, to the chamber, and thank her also for an extraordinarily powerful opening speech, setting out the experience of Deanne Fitzpatrick, an experience which I, I hope all of us across the chamber would find utterly intolerable, not only that she was subjected to those experiences, uh, but that she found herself in a position of having to, to seek out the support of an MSP to have those issues addressed and taken seriously in the first place. A person should not need that level of support and intervention in their lives. Any organisation, public sector, employer or private, should be taking the responsibility uh, to ensure that that kind of experience is, is not tolerable, not accepted and does not continue. I think over the, over the last... Uh, yes, yeah. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the member for taking an intervention. I wonder if the member will agree that Rhoda Grant's determination to get justice for her constituent over a decade is an example for us all. But will he join with me in demanding that this debate finally results in justice for Deanne because that has not been achieved yet? Patrick Harvey. Well, I would, I would want to see that and I hope we would all want to see that. And, and Rhoda Grant having done that work, will know far better than I how that justice can be delivered, how that can be achieved. Um, I wanted to, to reflect on the fact that our society over, the, over recent years has become more willing to acknowledge, for example, that in relation to domestic violence, gender-based domestic violence, uh, the, the courage and the bravery that it takes to report, the, the, the feeling of self-blame that some victims experience uh, as a, one of the things that, that, that sometimes prevents people from uh, taking action, reporting, getting out as soon as they might. These, these things are, are part of, of the experience, part of the effect, and sometimes part of the purpose of gender-based violence. Violence is inflicted in order to control uh, and to limit people's ability uh, to escape uh, and to assert themselves. That is something that plays out in the workplace as well. We, we've begun to acknowledge, I think, that this is a factor in domestic violence, but it exists in the workplace as well. That, that notion that violence and harassment are a form of controlling behavior, uh, and the, 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 the bravery and the courage and the, the difficulty that it takes to raise a challenge in the first place, and then to persist with it when that challenge is ignored. And that spectrum of behavior from uh, the most appalling, violent and abusive behavior uh, through to victim blaming, stigma against those who've raised a challenge, uh, right through to, to the kind of language that some people would dismiss uh, as banter or, uh, or as freedom of speech. That, that level of, of behavior that, that some people would dismiss as banter is itself part of the same spectrum of controlling behavior that creates a culture 
uh, whether in a, in, a, in a home or in a workplace, where people don't feel safe, don't feel able to speak out. I, I want to, to thank Engender as well for their briefing, uh, part of which says, sexual harassment recreates women's subordination through verbal and physical acts which assert that women and girls do not have equal access and rights to safety, public space, and physical autonomy. And I think that captures why this, this spectrum of behavior is so important. We cannot only think that the most abusive and most violent acts are the problem. That whole spectrum of behavior is the problem. It relates to every other form of, of inequality and prejudice as well. And as the, as the briefing makes clear, it relates uh, to issues of racism, Islamophobia, and so on in our society. I, I'm still uh, open to the argument that a, a misogynistic hate crime needs to be created as a standalone offence. However, that wasn't the view of the, the women's and, and feminist organisations in the first two or three times when we consulted on hate crime. If the position has changed, I think we need to have more of a, a chance for debate and scrutiny as to, as to why that argument has changed, why the balance of arguments around the criminal law has changed. Finally, presiding officer, I think we, we should all welcome the fact that this parliament, as a public sector employer, has been making progress. But we've also seen real challenges to the way issues around harassment and reports about harassment and discrimination uh, are, are reported in the press. And that affects itself how easy people will feel uh, it to be to make a report like that. We need to take responsibility for that on an ongoing basis and not simply think that because we've adopted a new policy, that's job done. We're going to continue to have that challenge to face uh, if we want people to feel the confidence that they can report issues and that they will be addressed in the way that we would all want them to be. Thank you. And I call Anas Sarwar to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by thanking Rhoda Grant uh, for giving us the opportunity to have this debate, but more importantly than that, uh, thank her for the very powerful contribution uh, she made. We all stand in solidarity with Diane Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick, and I hope all members across the chamber will stand shoulder to shoulder with Rhoda Grant in representing her constituent. Um, it's also an important opportunity for us to recognise the intersectionality of prejudice and hate and how there is a gendered bias uh, to all forms of prejudice and hate. Uh, the sad reality is that more often than not, the victim is a woman, and the sad reality is that almost always the perpetrator is a man, with 89% of recorded hate crime in Scotland being perpetrated by a male. Uh, last week, the cross-party group on tackling Islamophobia in partnership uh, with Amna Muslim Women's Resource Centre published the results of a survey of Muslim women across Scotland. And I wanted to just share some of those stats uh, with the chamber. 64% of women said that they'd either witnessed or experienced a hate incident or crime. 74% of that 64% said it happened to them themselves. It asked where the incident took place, 57% said in the street or in their neighborhood, 23% in the workplace, and 21% on public transport. And if I've got time, presenting officer, I'll come back uh, to the issue of public transport. 91%, and this is a startling statistic, 91% said that there was no bystander intervention or support following the incident. 91%. And 65% did not report the incident either to uh, the workplace uh, seniors or indeed to the police. Uh, there's a clear bias here. Uh, and if you actually hear the stories that go alongside the survey, uh, people who were born in Scotland, that shouldn't matter, but people who were born in Scotland, raised in Scotland, had their family in Scotland, told to go home and F off back to where they came from. Uh, women having their headscarves pulled from their heads in their underground stations uh, or railway stations. People saying that on 78% of those cases they were shouted uh, or sworn at. People being spat at on their own street, coming out their own front door or going on to a train station. People being sworn at. People scared to go to work the next morning. And most startling of all, a real clear majority of people saying that they think twice about using our public transport system in Scotland. Happy to. Patrick Harvey. Um, I, I, I thank the member for, for his comments. Uh, does he agree with me that the way in which politicians use language in relation to something like this is one of the factors that creates a situation where that kind of violence is thought by some 
to be acceptable? And what does it say about a, a, a situation where the, the language that Boris Johnson, for example, used in describing the appearance of Muslim women attracted no censure, no discipline from within his party, and he's still, again, being touted as a potential leadership candidate? And I saw I, I agree completely with uh, Patrick Harvey and I could probably spend the afternoon saying why Boris Johnson should not be the Prime Minister of the uh, United Kingdom. But the, the really important point is when you ask people, one, if they believe if prejudice and hate is on the rise, the answer is, is most often yes. And if you then ask them what they, are, what they attribute that rise to, the answer comes back, politicians and the media. So we've got to reflect on the language that politicians use, uh, the creating of the us versus them, the othering of our citizens and trying to fuel and sow the seeds of hate in order to get political gain and alongside that how that's then reported and amplified either through broadcast media through our mainstream media or indeed through social media uh, platforms uh, i want to just end presenting officer and saying just a bit specifically about uh, public transport uh, a, a majority of people saying they think twice about traveling on our public transport system that's simply not acceptable i know of women in my own constituency who will not use who refuse to use public transport because of the risk it has in terms of them getting abuse, threats, or indeed violence. I think something needs to be done specifically around our public transport infrastructure, and I'd be keen to engage with the minister in that in more detail. Can I just end by saying that um, silence is no longer an option. Um, we will not, uh, we can no longer afford to pick and choose what forms of prejudice and hate we want to stand up against. And crucially of all, we've got to build allies. And what I mean by that is, don't think talking to who you identify as probably being your own is going to be the solution. We need to build allies across all forms of prejudice and hate and come together and root out of our society, root out of our politics, root out of our public discourse and root out of communities across the country. Thank you. I'm conscious that uh, three more members wish to make a contribution as well as the Minister uh, and I'm minded to accept a motion uh, without notice to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes to accommodate them. So moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Grant. Um, would members agree the motion is that the, mo the business be extended by 30 minutes? Would members agree? Yes. Agreed, that is agreed. Can I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Maurice Corey? Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. Uh, and let me start by saying uh, nothing that uh, Rhoda Grant has described in the way of behaviours will ever in any context, at any place, at any time, in public or private uh, domains be acceptable behavior. Uh, so that is absolutely uh, my, my, my starting point. And in signing uh, Rhoda Grant's motion, uh, I found myself agreeing with every single word uh, in that motion. Although I do think uh, that it's not simply public agencies. I think there's a great deal of issues in the private sector as well. And I'm gonna make uh, a little bit of reference uh, to that. I will say I'm not as well prepared uh, to respond on the specifics of uh, Rhoda Grant's uh, uh, contribution simply because I wasn't aware that was to be the focus and it might have been helpful to have let me know and I would have wished to respond. But I, there's no discourtesy in my failing to engage directly in the, the detail of which I'm not wholly familiar and my shorthand didn't enable me to take enough of it down. Do, do forgive me. Um, I suppose there's a very simple little thing uh, that more than 30 years ago illustrated to me um, attitudes in other people that I hadn't quite twigged. I uh, recruited uh, a systems analyst, a lady, who had previously been a systems analyst, who'd been out of the job market for some time uh, raising a family. And I recruited her as a part-time member of staff. I assessed her as being highly competent with good previous experience. In the computer industry, things move fast. So I agreed with her that I would pay for her to go on a full-time course for her first week. And that was agreed with her, and I sent her on that course. Um, my boss discovered I had done this, and I got quite severely criticized for spending money on a course for a part-time woman. And I was absolutely shocked. It never, ever occurred to me. Uh, but it, it, it was shocking that my boss thought in those terms. Now, let me take that further. That person continued in her employment for several decades and then retired. On the day she retired, she would not leave the office until 8 o'clock at night that day because she wanted to complete the work that was in her entry. 
a more dedicated, committed person in our employment who, in her part-time employment, delivered much more than many male colleagues did in their full-time day. That is the sort of thing that we, we've had historically. And it's a great shame that to this day, we have not yet got to a position where the natural behaviors of too many of my gender in particular, Anna Sawa is absolutely correct on that, uh, ha, ha, has, has not moved. This is a huge uh, gender issue. And of course, until 1975, people like my wife, uh, Highly paid professional lady, not allowed to join her company's pension scheme. Something for which, in receipt of pension today, she continues to suffer. So this is a long-run issue. Now, on the issue of race uh, and, and, and similar, uh, and ethnicity. In my parliamentary constituency, we have a very diverse population. Uh, in Peterhead Academy, there are 24 languages. Um, and when many of the people came from elsewhere initially to the area, that did create genuine difficulties. There was resistance, there was abuse of people. But I commend the Aberdeenshire Council, not my party and administration, so I do so entirely honestly, who acted and organized uh, ways of getting the community uh, to realize the value of that diversity and what people were contributing economically, socially, and every possible way. And today, I see the benefit of that. Have we eradicated misogyny, racism, harassment, and sexism? No, alas, no. But it is dramatically different from where we are. I think... Uh, Mr. If, Stevenson, we draw his remarks to a conclusion. I will. I'll just, I'll just say um, eradicate is used twice in the motion. I think we must all work to eradicate. I have to say, I'm a wee bit pessimistic. If we will ever succeed, we must never stop trying. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. And I call Maurice Corey to be followed by David Stewart. <coughs> Thank you, presiding officer. And my goodness, what a, a powerful speech that was from our fellow member of uh, Diane's shocking experience. Um, I thank Rena Grant, uh, Rena Grant for putting forward this member's debate today. Uh, misogyny and harassment, sexism and racism, these are, reason these are big ongoing issues which are wholly unwelcome in our workplaces and wider communities. Racism, racism alone deserves its own focused discussion to find nuanced solutions and tailored ones at that. Across our society and sectors, there is still deep uh, seated um, instances which exist and completely unfounded prejudice. Surely none of us can deny that, and women especially strive to counter these prejudiced uh, stereotypes every day. And this problem seeps into everyday life, and especially in our workplaces. It manifests itself in the pay gender gap, in a distinct lack of promotions, and in the lack and lower expectations and presumptions made about women. I am sure these examples merely scratch the surface of how women experience sexism. It is unfortunate this has taken this long to realize the scale and magnitude of sexual harassment, especially in the work environment. And the Me Too movement has really shed an important light on these injustices which women can face in their employment. And the Scottish Parliament, just like every other workplace, is not immune to these issues surrounding gender bias. And it needs to set an example. Uh, we need as Scotland's uh, policymakers, which obviously it is trying to do now. As I see it, at the heart of the problem is an underlying culture and attitude which limits opportunities and presents barriers. While we need to wholeheartedly support more effective policies and practices that open the way for greater respect and fairness, this cannot be achieved without recognizing the need for a major societal shift at this root. If this underlying culture remains, laws and policies will struggle to cause lasting change which promotes gender equality. And for men to turn a blind eye and ignore instances of sexism harms the prospect of change. No one is immune from doing their part to tackle the issues we speak of today. Harassment has far-reaching consequences. Being targeted particularly through sexist and misogynistic comments can knock your confidence. In some instances, these women can feel unsafe to socialize with colleagues or even to progress in their career and put themselves forward for promotion. Indeed, in many cases, their advancement is limited precisely because of the impact of their self-confidence. It is completely unacceptable that women, subject to both casual or overt sexism, can lose and lose out on opportunities to advance and perform well at work. As I have said in this chamber before, 
the opportunities and contributions for women in the workplace strengthens our economy and a more diverse and insightful workforce makes for better results. Surely part of the answer is to encourage employers to set out clear guidelines and policies to tackle these problems. But one of the main challenges can be lack of confidence in reporting the issue in the first place. And this should never be the case. Workplaces need to, establish, to be established to establish practices which have uh, properly, considered and the, uh, are properly considered and the feelings of the complainant in an environment free from intimidation, apathy and ignorance. And moreover, a modern working environment, one that breaks away from a male-orientated traditional culture, can also create welcome changes. And for example, ensuring the availability of childcare provision, more part-time posts, encourages a greater inclusion awareness of women in the workplace, and a responsive place of work can make all the difference. And I welcome the discussion and consultation of the Scottish Government in its review of hate crime offences uh, in Scotland. And we have to recognise that we cannot have a one-size-fits-all answer for targeting harassment and misogyny. Surely, this, the differing context needs and complex issues faced by women, wherever they are, deserve a tailored approach. And this especially rings true when we consider women of colour who wrongly face their own particular barriers at work, and indeed we've heard on transport from Anasawa. The presumptions made of them, based upon an inherent prejudice, means that even applying for the jobs which they can present challenges for them. So I hope the Scottish Government will encourage the involvement of charities and organisations that can really shape the solution for these women. And to conclude, Presiding Officer, I join colleagues in saying that there is absolutely no place for harassment, sexism, misogyny or racism in Scotland, or indeed anywhere. While I have focused on problems centred in the work environment, I recognise it can be seen in everyday life and I hope to see more entrenched policies which encourage greater awareness and equality for women and then target the discriminating practices which they come up against. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And could I congratulate my colleague uh, Rhoda Grant for securing this afternoon's important debate and for her first-class campaigning and advocacy on behalf of her constituent for over a decade. I've watched intently from the sidelines and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute today. And having been involved with staff in the ongoing review into NHS Highland bullying and harassment investigation, there's no doubt that every employee deserves to be treated with dignity and respect at work. There is no excuse in the workforce for bullying, no excuses, not ever. Bullying and harassment are totally unacceptable and of course constitute a violation of international human and legal rights. Bullying and harassment undermines physical and mental health. But what we've heard today from many speakers, particularly Rhoda Grant, is that Deanne was subject to institutional racism, sexism, harassment and abuse at the hands of Marine Scotland, which for 10 years this week has been a part of the core Scottish Government. And after becoming a whistleblower, she was excluded and cut out by many of her work colleagues. And over the years, the aggressive behaviour was constant and undermined, undermining. She was constantly being held to a different standard than others, on toil, on holidays, and time off for compassionate leave, or for medical reasons. On every occasion, she was questioned while others were not. And we've heard about the language that was used. Who would believe this was a Scottish government office? And on the 28th of May, 2014, Deanne received a letter from Paul Johnston, who's now the Director General of the Scottish Government in charge of education and justice, following her Fairness at Work appeal hearing. And I quote presiding officer from the letter, it was clear to the panel on reviewing the findings of the deciding officer alongside the report from the investigating officer and the extensive material that you've submitted to support your case that there have been serious, uh, there have been significant historical shortcomings in the way in which you've been treated as a member of the Scottish Government staff based in the Scrabster office. This letter goes on to say that, and I quote, there seems to be substantial agreement among all parties that the council that prevailed historically in the Scrabster office was not acceptable. And moreover, Mr Johnson says that the panel concluded that Diane should receive a very specific apology because personal information about her was placed on a public calendar. He continued, I wish to apologise on behalf of the Scottish Government for the fact that personal information about you was made available in this way. As a result of this hearing, disciplinary proceedings taken against Diane were found to be flawed and removed from her record. Now, after the apology presiding officer, things were looking up for Diane as she's promoted to a senior fishery officer in the Scrabster office, but this was short-lived. And it appears as soon as they thought the focus had shifted 
her line management could again pursue her and seek to punish her for speaking out on behalf of colleagues. Now, here we are today with Deanne refusing the right to turn to work and Marine Scotland and the Scottish Government turning a deaf ear to her case for justice. What we heard today is the tip of the iceberg of what Deanne's endured over the last decade. My colleague Rhoda Grant's plea for an independent inquiry into Deanne's treatment by the Scottish Government is well-founded and it's a call whose time has come. Thank you very much. And can I now call on the Minister to conclude our debate? Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I would also uh, like to join uh, everyone else that's spoken today and commend Rosa Grant for bringing forward this motion. Misogyny, racism, harassment and sexism have no place in today's society or in our working environment. I am also very pleased to see the revised sexual harassment policy, which has been sent out to all Scottish Parliament staff, MSPs and the researchers. And I know that Rosa Grant and Rona Mackay have taken great care with that piece of work. This policy is necessary and I'm very glad that it has been implemented and that in addition to reporting sexual harassment, it records sexist behaviour. Let me be clear, presiding officer, sexist behaviour creates a culture where harassers continue to harass without consequences. That will no longer be the case. Sometimes this mean, means we need to broaden the minds of some men and their understanding of what abuse is. And as Rona Mackay and uh, Patrick Harvey expressed, behaviour which might seem harmless to others office banter, if you like, is felt differently if you are the subject of that. Those men probably aren't thinking about the level of sexual violence in society or the dozens of women killed by men in the UK every year, but you are when you are the victim. Everyone has the right to a safe and respectful working environment, and it is the respons responsibility of everyone who works in that organisation to make sure that it is so. Leaders like us and others need to encourage mutual respect, set an example, challenge attitudes and hold their staff accountable for their actions. We want to do more to help make this type of a positive culture in the workplace the norm, not the experience that many of us have had. It is imperative that this government continues to make clear that sexual harassment is unacceptable and that we all have a, a part to play in making it a thing of the past. That's why as part of our work to implement Equally Safe, we are in the process of developing a public campaign to raise awareness of it and ensure that it is called out wherever it takes place. This will complement our wider work around prevention and challenging the underlying attitudes that allow violence against women and girl, girls to flourish. Annie Wells, Patrick Harvey, Maurice Corey, Stuart Stevenson and other speakers today have linked very clearly misogyny, discrimination and harassment to women's inequality and the power imbalance that we see across our society. This has been expressed so eloquently over years by Engender, Close the Gap and other organisations. That is why we are funding Equally Safe at Work pilot to provide a set of standards for employers to use to make sure that their working environments encourage mutual respect and clearly condone and deal and clearly condone and deal with harassment or clearly don't condone and, and, and deal with the harassment and the attitudes that foster it. This parliament noted the importance of the pilot in a members debate by Gail Ross just last month. We, yes, certainly. Rhoda Grant. Um, I, the minister is one of those I haven't written to on behalf of Diane in the past and I understand that some of the information she has heard today will come as a shock and she will not have been prepared to hear it. But would she give a commitment to look and speak to colleagues, I know she's not in charge of that directorate, but to speak to colleagues about putting in place a totally independent inquiry? Because until this is sorted, people think that they can get off with this behaviour. And it stands out as a beacon, an example, and it empowers and brave, it, it, it empowers people who, who would treat women and indeed other colleagues in this way. Minister. Um, I appreciate and I know how strongly Rosa Grant and many others feel about the, issue that has, the issues that Deanne has faced. And I know that it's still subject to an ongoing uh, uh, process and that it means that, uh, uh, you know, an internal process that, that really I, I shouldn't be getting involved in. It would be completely inappropriate for me to comment on at this time. I know that Rhoda Grant has been offered um, a meeting with Scottish Government officials to discuss this and I would urge her to take up that offer if she, if she can. 
Um, presiding officer, we are taking a number of steps through Equally Safe strategy to help create a society where violence against women and girls is a thing of the past. This includes investing in prevention work in schools, public awareness raising, funding initiatives like White Ribbon Campaign that encourage men to see themselves as part of the solution and to stand up for progress. Or, or our work on Equally Safe sits alongside a number of other strategies and action plans that work together to make Scotland a fairer and more equal place to live for everybody here. It's also, it was also my pleasure to address the Race Equality Employment Conference last week to address the very issues Annie Wells and Anas Sarwar have raised in their contributions. This was a joint effort between different policy areas of human rights, race equality, fair work and economic development to address the system systemic barriers for minority ethnic people in the workplace. The intersectionality of women in those workplaces was a key um, a theme in that work. I look forward to seeing similar work that brings people from different sectors to pull their skills and address these pervasive problems. And I'd be happy to discuss these issues with Anas Sarwar that he raised today. We spend about a third of our working life at work. The importance of setting example for a safe and respectful working environment cannot be overestimated. As leaders, we must remember that what we say and what we do and what we allow to pass without comment has a wider impact. You do not what, what you do not condemn, you condone. And I want to make that absolutely clear here today. The thought of Boris Johnson being our Prime Minister should actually chill us all, and that was an issue that was raised earlier. It is up to us to be clearer and more fearless in openly saying that what we stand for, what we will not condone on any level, and to set that example every day in our work environment and in our personal lives. The message from Anas Sawa in this place is that we must not be bystanders. Silence is not an option. By showing that misogyny, racism, harassment and sexism has no place in political governance in Scotland, we will reinforce our efforts to tackle them across the country and give the people of Scotland the opportunity to, to see that we mean exactly what we say. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister, Christina McKelvey. And point of order, Elaine Smith. Uh, I wonder if we could just clarify that Rhoda Grant's constituent, Deanne, uh, the, the procedure that was referred to isn't a legal procedure as such, it's a disciplinary procedure, and as such that it really shouldn't have um, precluded the Minister from indicating that she would be willing at least to look into an independent inquiry into this issue with her colleagues that know about the issue previously. Can I thank the member? That is a point of clarification which I'm sure all members, including the Minister, will have noted. And uh, can I thank all the members for their contribution? I close this meeting. I suspend, in fact, sorry, till 2.30. Till 2.30. Not closing.